All right, aviators, let's go, guys. It's Friday. Welcome to Up and Away Lesson Series. It's our fourth lesson brought to you by all of us here at the Project AVA team. So excited to have you aboard. Today we'll be going over the, let's say, the finer things, the finer things in the cockpit. These are things that are critical for helping our aircraft be in good condition, which is really important if you want to fly at all. So welcome aboard. We're back here in the Cessna 172 cockpit. And before we before we uh, continue on to our lesson, there's just a couple of things we should go over in our pre-stream briefing. So as you know, these are our slides, not our slides, sorry. This is the spreadsheet, the master spreadsheet with all the links in it. Uh, make sure if you're ever lost with all the links that we send you in our email, um, fret not, we've got a nice big spreadsheet here and the notes and guiding questions for each of those lessons are all here ready to go, as well as the links to the YouTube streams and the slides with the slide number in parentheses, just in case you need uh, to help find it. But actually, if you just click on the slide link here and wait a couple seconds, it'll take you directly to the slide, just like this. So you shouldn't have to worry about that. And we also have a table of contents, just in case you get lost here. So that's great. Um, that's that's it for this spreadsheet. Now, one other thing, uh, we have been sending you emails about a survey that we uh, created to uh, help cater our lessons to you all, because we want to make sure we're appealing to all of your interests. And uh, many, many of you actually equally have expressed interest in not only being a pilot, but also being an aerospace engineer, which is really great to hear, because thankfully we have both of those backgrounds here in our Project Aviate Officer team, and we're so excited that We'd be able to educate you on both sides of what's going on here, the things that we're teaching. So today, for those of you aerospace engineer wannabes, today will be a little bit up your alley because we're going to be going over a little bit of, you know, the structure, the building of airplanes, you know, the parts of it that matter that actually um, help keep the airplane in good condition rather than just flying it. So... So excited. Let's just jump right into it. So back here in the Cessna 172 cockpit, let's go ahead and load up some slides, the things that we don't normally like. But anyway, <laughs> here are the slides. Uh, there we go. The big one's fine. Okay, so let me get... So as I was, as I was saying... Oh, wow, my camera blocks the... As I was saying, um, we now know how to fly an airplane. We know how to take our yoke, we're not to take off, land, you know, maintain steady flight, and we sort of understand the physics of what's going on, the way the air interacts with our airplane and allows it to generate lift, bank left and right, pitch up and down, and yaw side to side, left or right. And that's great. That's what helps us get, get in the air. But as with any, as with any machine, you not only have to use it, but you also have to maintain it. And that's what the small things we're going to talk about, the not so critical things. And not so critical means not so critical for actually flying, but alternatively, keeping our airplane in good condition. So let's just jump right into the cockpit and get started. So you know, this is a Cessna 172 cockpit. We've got the whole panel there, all the fancy cages, switches, levers, whatnot, what have you. Right? And something you might remember from our previous lessons is the six pack, the primary flight instruments. These are the ones that actually tell us how we are flying, basically. We need our airspeed indicator to tell us how fast we're going. Uh, let me just get zoom it into it. We need our airspeed indicator to tell us how fast we're going. We need our attitude indicator to tell us uh, our nose relative to the horizon the direction that we're going relative to the horizon. We need to know how high we are, so an altimeter. We need to know what direction we're going, so a heading indicator. And we need to know how fast we're going up and down, so a vertical speed indicator. This is so that we can make sure we're flying smoothly and safely. And of course, we also have the turn coordinator. Um, and I, we did promise that we would go over it soon. Uh, we'll be ready to go over the turn coordinator uh, the next time we actually get in the air and fly because there's another there's a little bit of physics behind why we need a turn coordinator that we will go over very soon. But for First, now, uh, Nikhil, real quick. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but 
Uh, people in the chat want to know uh, what airport you are at right now. Oh, okay. Uh, we are at Seattle Airport. So if we were to let me, if you type K K S E A K S E A into your airport location thingamajig, you'll be able to go there. Uh, today it doesn't really matter what airport you're at because we're mainly going to be looking at instruments. So all the fancy gauges you have here. So if you don't feel like starting up at any particular airport. Start wherever you want, basically. Um, all right, so let's just get out of let's just get out of the slide because slides are boring. Welcome to the real cockpit. So uh, that's your six pack, right? The six instruments that are literally in a box. You'll see this box here, the six pack. But you notice this one? There was one other instrument that was inside that picture. There was one more, the tachometer. Now, what we what do we do to figure out how fast we're going? Airspeed indicator, right? That's how fast we're going. But this doesn't often tell us how well our engine is doing. Like, sometimes we our plane might slow down, or sometimes it might get faster, but we don't know how hard our engine is working to do that. And those of you who sort of know, like, basic fundamentals of engineering, every machine has its limits, right? And we need to be able to understand what the limits of our machine here, the airplane, is. And one way we do that is to know how much are we stressing the engine? How hard is the engine working to take us this fast? How hard is the engine working to allow us to fly? And that is why we need to measure how fast it's rotating. Because what's an engine doing? What's our propeller doing? This big giant propeller that you see, it's spinning very, very, very fast. So that is obviously the big reason that engines are stressed. The fact that the propeller is spinning is what's stressing our engine. And so to measure, we need to be able to measure that. Since that's the thing that's stressing our engine, we need a way to measure how fast the propeller is spinning. Hence, we have our tachometer, more simply known as the RPM gauge or the rotations per minute gauge. And as you can see, it has RPM nicely written in the middle. Rotations per minute, how fast is the propeller spinning? how many times is it rotating per minute and it's measured in hundreds so you'll see a five here this means 500 rotations per minute you see a 10 here that's 10 hundred or 1000 rotations per minute 1500 rotations per minute 2000 rotations per minute etc so this is one critical way we measure the state of our engine at all points in flight and that's why it's a really critical instrument um that's basically it for the front panel. Now we have to now we get to deal with all the other side instruments here. And for that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Steven. Steven, take it away. Cool. So our engines, of course, you know all of the So you know our cars run on something called fuel because you go to the gas station and you fill up your tanks. Same thing for an aircraft. It also runs on fuel. So where our engines run on fuel basically and fuel runs out sometimes because we might not you know pay attention which is something that we always want to check before we fly so one instrument that helps us know how much fuel we have is the fuel gauge um are you going to be showing them yeah now? yeah i'm zooming into it sorry can't move here we go <laughs> There you go. On the engine instruments, the top left, it says fuel. Left and right, there's two tanks. And if you didn't know, the fuel tanks are located in the wings. And there's a left and right tank. In the bigger planes, there's also center tanks in the middle of the aircraft. Um, and of course, in the Cessna, there's 26 on both sides. That's uh, 52 gallons total. And it's each tick mark is just increments of 5 gallons. Yeah, measured in gallons. And as for uh, fuel being on the wings, you'll actually notice if you go into your outside view, you'll see these uh, red, these little red circles. And you might even see the letters AVGAS. What does that stand for? <laughs> it just stands for aviation gas. Exactly. And also, I don't know if my camera's working on your end. Oh, sorry. I should probably. There we go. Oh, it's back in. It's loading again. All right, that's okay. You can keep going. And we have it on both sides. We have it on both wings. Fuel is stored in the wings because, well, the wings are really large, and they happen to be a very good storage space for fuel. Because, I mean, 
there isn't really anywhere else you could put it. Most of the rest of the plane is full of either ourselves sitting in it or the engine with its bazillions of parts all in here and storage space back here. So not much space left, which is why the wings are really useful for storing fuel. And that's basically the case for all, all planes. Most planes store their fuel in the wings. All right. One fun fact is that there's many types of fuel in aviation and each type of fuel is different colors. In the Cessna, it most commonly used fuel is a 100 low lead and it's colored blue. So mm -hmm. literally the fuel inside the tanks are blue. Oh yeah, this is... Which you don't yeah. see until you physically look at the fuel. Yeah, we don't have Anyways. fuel samples. Yeah, let yeah. me bring that. Anyways, next one is oil. So of course, you know, there is always oil in your cars. You have probably seen your parents uh, take out a little oil dipstick from the engine just to check how much oil there is in the engines. Or you might have seen your parents changing the oils of a car. Um, you drain it from the bottom, you put new oil from the top in the funnel. Same thing for a airplane engine. It, work, it works the same way. And oil, oil does the same thing too. So oil basically lubricates the engine. It also cools down the engine and cleans the engine. That's why over time you have to change the oil because the oil might change uh, after hours of usage. It might turn a darker color, which means that it's cleaning the engine. It's doing its job. So that's why you change your oil. But oil gets hot. And in the Cessna, there is a gauge. Uh, and also in most cars they have it too, but it is a oil temperature. So you could show that in the plane. There's also there's also something called um, oil pressure, that which is right next to it. You don't really oh, yeah. have to learn about it much but they're right next to each other oil temperature on the left and then oil pressure on the right if you have too much uh pr if your pressure is too low that means not enough oil is probably in the engine or it's an oil leak which is not good because the engine will overheat but if you have too much pressure that means there's too much oil in the engine and it it might blow up i don't know <laughs> it's gonna flood the engine with oil yeah so you notice that there's red lines and there's also green lines. Um, of course, green is good. Red is bad in aviation. If it touches the red, it's bad. If it's in the green, it's good. Uh, so that's basically your oil yep. um, gauges, instruments. Fine, Last really. one we have is vacuum pumps. And of course, a vacuum sucks air, like you know your vacuum cleaner that you use to clean the carpet off your floor. And what it does is I'm sure you all know that the vacuum sucks air and it sucks the dust off the carpet. In the engines, it basically sucks air. And if you could show them which instruments uses the vacuum pump, basically, yeah. we're not going to teach you what's behind those instruments, but the attitude indicator and the heading indicator, they use the vacuum pump. Whoops. There's a little spinning disc inside these two instruments. There's a physical disc that's spinning really, really fast. You can hear it sometimes when you turn on your airplane, it spools up. Um, that's basically the vacuum pump sucking air. And when the air is sucked, um, the disc spins inside that little cage. And of course, the vacuum um, gauge shows you your vacuum pump's uh, status. See, it says VAC for vacuum. Um, and it says 765432 or 3. And of course, you want it to be in the green range. If you're idling your RPM too low, then it's going to be doing what it's doing right now, which is below the green band. Yeah. Uh, but when you rev up your engine and you put the throttle in, it should go back to green, which is normal. So when he says idling, uh, basically, we're at the lowest throttle setting possible. You remember this. This is the throttle. This is how we get thrust, right? When it's at its lowest setting, it's called idle. And obviously, when you add thrust, when you go ahead and increase your throttle, the engine spins faster, RPM increases. But as he, as Steven was mentioning, we also have more vacuum uh, pressure inside that because that's what the engine helps supply this vacuum pressure. And so that is why this starts to increase as well. And you want to keep that in the green range. You want to keep that in the green range throughout all of flight or just on the ground? Which one, the vacuum? Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry, it just in the green. It should be green the entire flight, other than the ground. Um, uh, yeah. Because your RPM might be too low. Yeah. 
Okay, and that might be it. Uh, yeah, so you want to make sure your vacuums are good because that's what's it helps to suck air and then power the instruments that rely on the vacuum, namely the attitude indicator and heading indicator. So those are the instruments that we basically went over. Oh, you want to go over HT and fuel flow real fast? Yeah, sure. So there's also one more instrument that says EGT and fuel flow. Fuel flow is pretty explanatory. It's just how many, how much fuel gallons per hour is going into the engine. Um, I think there's, it says 5, 10, 15, 19, I think. Can't really see, but. Yeah, it's a 19. But uh, of course, you want to be in the green range. When you're on the ground, you're idling, your RPM, the, the fuel flow won't, you know, go up too much. But normally, when you're cruising in a Cessna, you use approximately eight to 10 gallons per hour. So you would expect that needle to go up to right a little less than 10 gallons per hour, which is inside the green range, which is fine. If yeah. it's excessive and it's above the green range, that means something's wrong. Fuel, you're probably gonna lose fuel really quick, which isn't normal. Right next to it is EGT. It is called the exhaust gas temperature. Um, and up and away, you're not, we're not gonna teach you really how to use it, but it just means the temperature of the gas coming out of the aircraft. Um, you might, if you can, you could, you should show them the uh, little, in the front, the little exhaust. Yep, pipe. right here. There you go. So yeah, there's a little sensor right inside of that, and it measures the temperature of the gas coming out of that little cylinder tube. Just like how your car is a tailpipe. This is yeah. the tailpipe, <laughs> even though it's at the very front of the plane, because that's where the propeller is, so that's where the gas has to come out. Yeah. And you guys might be asking, what what is this little EGT is used for? Well, we talked about leaning the engine. Well, not a lot, but leaning engine means that you're giving less fuel to the engines because the higher you fly, air is less dense, meaning you need less fuel. So normally when you're cruising at higher altitudes, you would lean out the fuel, meaning you're putting less fuel into the engines. And to basically fine tune how much fuel you need into the engines, you use the EGT gauge depending on its temperature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so why don't we quickly demonstrate what they do? You can go ahead and increase your throttle a little bit. RPM goes crazy. That's great. Your uh, vacuum pressure also goes up. That's great. But you notice here, I'm going to uh, bring throttle down and then increase throttle, decrease throttle, increase throttle. And you might expect the effect. When we have more, when the engine is spinning faster, it's obviously sucking a lot more fuel. And therefore, the fuel flow rate, how fast the fuel is being injected into the engine, increases and should roughly remain in the green range for duration of flight and of course because the engine is sucking more fuel it's burning more fuel just like how if you've ever finished driving in a car and you went and touched the hood right it's really hot similarly the gases get really hot when you burn them and that's why your egt rises and it falls once you bring your throttle down because there's much less gas coming out of the pipe which is at the nose of the plane all right, so those are our main engine instruments. These are, these are the key instruments to making sure our engines are in good condition. So now we've gone over most of the hardware aspect of the airplane that keeps it in good condition, mainly about the engine, because the engine is probably one of the most important moving parts on an airplane because the propeller's spinning so fast, which is why we have to be making sure that we're keeping that in as good condition as possible. Because you notice the rest of the control surfaces are not moving as extremely, right? They're just moving side to side, left or right, up and down. But the engine is spinning thousands and thousands of rotations per minute, so we need to be keeping those in good conditions. All right, now our next part of our instruments are going to be the, oh, you see it? Yeah, here we go. Obviously, if you ever you if you own an electronic device, well, this is gonna sound so dumb. If you own an electronic device, you probably turn it on. So we need a way to turn things on and off inside our airplane. Because if we keep it running forever, what happens? We don't got that energy anymore. And also, save power, right? Just like how you turn off your phone, you need a way to do that. So I have 
uh, Stephen continue talking about these as well. All right, so I'm just going to go... Actually, I'm going to go right to left to make it easier. Sure. The one on the right is avionic switches. They're basically switches that power all the electronics in the aircraft. So anything that uses electric, like your GPS, um, your radios, stuff like that. So maybe you can demonstrate turning them off and turning them on in the sim. Sorry, yeah, give me, give me one second. So he's talking about the avionic switches. Fancy word for electrical stuff, um, or I guess your displays and such. Notice your, your plane will have these fancy iPad looking screens. We're not sponsored by Apple. Uh, and they turn off. If you play around with these switches, they turn back on. You turn them off, they go off. They're mainly responsible for these displays right here. So you can technically fly without them because we're not going to be go over these particular displays right now. But just know that these are the uh, uh, electronics that you would need for navigation and communication and things like that. Yep. Next to the left is a pedo heat. Now, you may or may not know what a pedo tube is. It is on the outside of your aircraft, and it basically tells you your airspeed. It basically measures the air going inside the tube and the pressure, and it tells you your airspeed. Now, if that thing is blocked, well, you don't know your airspeed. When you're driving a car, if you don't see your speed, it's, kind of, it's you're fine because you're still driving, you can still brake, and you can still accelerate. But when you're flying, you don't know how fast you're flying without that pitot tube. You could be over speeding or you could be stalling. And when you stall an aircraft, your aircraft's not generating enough lift, meaning your airplane may fall out of the sky. So the pitot heat basically ensures that your tube will not get blocked because if there is water in your tube and you're flying in cold weather, the water might freeze up. And when it freezes up, it blocks the tube. That's why you have a pitot heat. And when you flip that switch on, the pitot tube gets really hot. And I've burned myself with that once. Not fun, but you know, it's hot. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry, let me go ahead and switch back into the cockpit here. So yeah, as Steven was mentioning, um, the way we measure our speed in the air, because we're moving in the air super quickly, Air is like slapping our wings, slapping our propeller, slapping the whole plane, right? So one easy way we can measure our speed is to just figure out how fast is that air slapping us as we're flying through the air. And that's what, that's all this does. It's a pitot tube. It just checks how fast the air is going whew, right through it. You know, that's all the pitot tube does. All right. Right next to it, you have the light switches. It's labeled lights, and you have the beacon, the landing lights, taxi, navigation lights, and strobes. Now, you've probably seen aircrafts in the sky at night, and you you may have wondered why they have lights that blink really fast, and they're white. Those are your strobe lights. They're on the edges of the wings, and they blink white really fast, just like what Nikhil is showing right now. Those are your strobe lights. Now, your nav lights are a little bit different. Nav lights are crucial because at night, when you see another plane, if you if you see a little white speck in the distance, you don't know if they're going towards you, if they're going away from you, if they're mm -hmm. going to the left or to the right of you. Now, the nav lights tell you which way they're flying. If you look at the edges of the wing, maybe you should turn off the strobe lights so it doesn't confuse them. Sure. But if you turn off the strobe lights and you turn on the nav lights, you will see that one side of the wing is red, the other one's green. Well, yep. the red one is always the left side and the green one is always the right side. So depending on on when you see an aircraft at night, if you see the red on one side and the green on the other side, you would you would be able to know if they're flying away from you, towards you, or to your left or to your right. Now, one more thing is the red one is on the left, the green one's on the right. The back is also white. So if you see white at night, they're probably flying away from you. So if you see a white and you see a red to your left and a green to your right, they're flying away from you. Now, if it's the opposite, if you see red to your right and green to your left, they're flying towards you. 
So that's how you identify which way planes are flying at night. And of course, nav lights are required at night, so that's their purpose. Yeah, I think we can leave the other lights for now and just move on to fuel pump and masters. I mean, yeah, the other ones are pretty explanatory. Taxi and landing lights, you use them while you're taxiing or landing. Yeah. Taking off, too. Um, circuit breakers aren't that important. You may or may not know what they are. Circuit breakers, if something stops working in the aircraft, you can pull them, push them back in, reset them. Just electric stuff. It basically resets the electric current to specific instruments. You might have seen that if you and have a power, you... if your power goes out in your house or something, or in a specific room, your parents might go to the circuit breaker that's maybe in the garage, and they'll try and figure out what's wrong. Same thing here. And then you got the fuel pump switch. Mm -hmm. um, did we talk about this before? I think I remember talking about using a lawnmower. Uh, it might have Did been I? doing Maybe. a club meeting. It might have been. Well, here. if you guys have gasoline lawnmowers, you may or may not see your parents push a little button multiple times in the front of the lawnmower, and that is to prime the engine. You are pushing, you are forcing gas into the engine so that um, the engine can fire up. Same thing for a Cessna. You need gas in the engine before you can start the engine up. So the fuel pump sends hot gas, pressurized hot gas into the engine cylinder so that you can start it right up. That's basically what the fuel pump does. Right. Okay. You got your master switch. Master switch, basically the master controls everything. With that with that master switch off, you can't do anything in the aircraft. That's why it's colored and red. And the master switch also overrides the avionics switch. Oh yeah. So that... like, it's probably one of the first things you need to turn on before you start the plane. Because mm -hmm. without the master switch on, you, you have a dead plane. It's cold and dark. Basically. <laughs> That's literally what it's called. It's called cold and dark because yep. none of the instruments are on. So it's dark with no lights and cold because, well, nothing's heating up. And it's also probably very cold in the cockpit if nothing is on. So yeah, literally cold and dark. The last one on the left is your magneto switch. This is basically your, your ignition. In your car, you turn your keys to start. Or maybe you have a fancy car, you push a button. But, you know, <laughs> the old cars, you, you put in your key and you turn. Well, they do similar things, the magnetos. Um, in your car, you have spark plugs that fire up the cylinders and you get, you know, power. But the magnetos is what powers the spark plugs in the plane. If you don't know what spark plugs are, they're basically um, devices that send, like, you know, I don't even know how to describe this. They send, like... You've ever seen, like, a combustion? Like, like if you know, yeah, for those of you... Spark they send a spark into the the engine cylinder mm -hmm. so that the fuel that's coming in can be set like on explode. fire and explode and push to get the prop spin you might have because yeah, if you just have fuel inside a cylinder it, it just sits there but if you have a spark plug it sends basically it lights it up and it fires yeah. now your magnetos is what power powers the spark plugs notice yeah. how there's a start both left right and off you yeah. want your magneto switch to be off when you're not in the plane. You want it to be on both when you're flying and you use start when you start the engines. You never want you never want it to be on the left or the right while flying because it's for redundancy purposes. If the left set of magnetos fail, you still have the right and then vice versa. You still have a set of magnetos that runs your engine. Because if the magnetos fail, you are basically not firing you're not, the cylinders. And, and you're not causing it, the propeller to spin you're not, anymore. You're not, spin, you're not gonna spin the propeller. Yeah. Oh, by the because, way. like the spark plugs are on a timer, so it has to fire very rapidly. So mm -hmm. every single time the piston goes back down, the fuel goes in and then has to blow it up. So that's why you hear the engine rev. That's why it explodes super fast. Yeah. And, like, and yeah. that's why every single time you hear a, like a pop, the spark plug is happening. So basically, if your magnetos go out, then you're just kind of screwed. This basically what's happening is you spark gases inside here and it sparks, it ignites it and causes this cylinder right here to move down and up, down and up like that. And that causes this to rotate, which helps your propeller rotate. Don't worry about all these words, these are two fancy words, but just know that this is how your propeller is spinning all together. Oh, by the way, if you wanted to start your propeller like you start in a car, this isn't the right, this isn't the formal way to do it, but if you wanted to try, you could just probably do this and eventually it'll start. At least an X-Plane, it lets you do that. 
Keep in mind, it's not the actual way to start the engine, but if you really wanted to play around with the keys, th there, you could do it. All right, now we just got one little set of instruments left, and that's it. Uh, I will go ahead and have Yuvraj uh, talk about the yeah, last. Yeah, there's this set, and then actually there's the one below this too. Oh yeah. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, hello everyone. This is the center console, sort of, uh, in the plane, so if you if you've ever been in a car, you can, you know, the part where your AC is, where your uh, entertainment screen is, where you can mess around with stuff. It's kind of like <laughs> in that spot, but in an airplane. Uh, so as you can see, the the lever that's marked throttle, the one that you can push in, well, it's a throttle. It controls uh, what power setting your engine is on. And you can kind of tell that power setting by uh, the tachometer or the RPM gauge that we just went over. Right next to it, in the red, is mixture control. So what the mixture control does is it controls the amount of fuel that is going into the engine. Because at sea level, when you're starting up the engine, taxiing, taking off, the air is a certain density. There's a certain amount of oxygen in the air. And uh, that's why you need the appropriate, appropriate amount of fuel to burn it. But as you go higher, the oxygen in the air, there's less of it. The air gets thinner. So you don't need as much fuel in the in uh, in order to run the engine. So you can gently pull back on the mixture control, and that'll kind of reduce the amount of fuel that is going into the engine cylinder and burning up the oxygen. Uh, be careful not to overdo do it with cutting the fuel out, though, because you can actually choke the engine and kill it. Um, so yeah, you don't want to do that. That's why it's um, red. And Exactly, that's why it's red. So if, if something is red, be really careful with it in an airplane. Uh, right below that, between the throttle and the mixture control, is the alternate static air switch. And what that does is there's actually a static port on the outside. Uh, uh, and uh, it's kind of like the port that you need for the vacuum system to work uh, and power the, uh, the attitude indicator and the heading indicator like you went over. And what happens is in case the static port is blocked but for any reason, sometimes it's ice, sometimes it's random obstructions, sometimes I've heard cases of, uh, I think, insects getting in there and making nests. <laughs> uh, yeah, weird stuff, I know. Uh, but yeah, it can mess up your instruments and they can show up different uncoordinated things. So if that's happening, what you do is you can pull on the alternate static air switch and it, it, pulls, uh, it opens up the backup static air port so that you can safely use your instruments still. Um, so that's about that. And then there's the flap switch on the right. Uh, and we went over the flaps before. They they basically make your, they come out the back, they make your wings bigger, they increase drag, they increase lift. Um, but that's that's how you control them. So it's just a little paddle. And then if you, you get down and you can see it has markings of 10 degrees, 20 degrees and full, which is a 30 degrees on a Cessna 172. Um, but yeah, that's how you control that. And then there's switches around it, which is for the lights and the air conditioning system, but that's not important for now. Yeah. Uh, can you move to the next panel? Our last bit of instruments. Right. So let me start out with the trim wheel on the left. So basically when you're flying the plane, you know, there you have an elevator, uh, you pull the elevator and the plane goes up. You push the elevator and the plane goes down. Um, but say you're, you, you're trying to climb up in a plane and you have to hold the elevator up. If you don't want to hold it, if you don't want to keep holding it and put pressure on your arm, what you can do is you can pull back the elevator and you can move the trim wheel up. So it, it, it adjusts the position of the elevator without you having to put pressure on it. Uh, and basically you keep put, uh, adjusting the trim wheel until the pressure on the on the yoke is gone, the pressure on your hand from the yoke is gone, and it kind of holds that position for you. So that yeah. comes in real handy. Uh, yeah. And on bigger planes, you can find trim for rudder and uh, uh, ailerons too, but on a Cessna, it's just for the elevator. Yeah. Uh, so can we look at the panel again, Mikhail? Uh, I just wanted to show you what you were talking about. So sometimes oh, right. sometimes you want to just, you know, fly, if sometimes you just want to climb comfortably, you know, you're mm -hmm. climbing into the air comfortably, and you notice the elevator is slightly pitched up just like this so we are oh the yoke's not even showing we are slightly pulling back on the yoke and maybe if you didn't want to keep doing that forever you can go ahead and do your trim wheel you can go trim wheel nose up so you can 
slide it down like this. And then if you just stopped touching, I'm no longer touching my yoke. I gotta keep it straight though. Still going down a little bit. But now, trim it up. I trimmed it up a bit. And now, the plane's climbing on its own. It's a fake Perfect. autopilot. It's a lazy autopilot. And mm -hmm. so, that's right. You can see that this and if you, little. If you look thing, at the little red, uh, or not the red, the silver uh, dot next to the trim wheel, that shows you what position your trim. Uh, uh, your trim setting is on, so it it shows you if, if your trim is uh, trimmed to nose up or nose down, and then it has a marking right in the middle uh, for neutral, because that's where your trim tab needs to be during takeoff, so that it's not introducing weird alien forces and making your yoke feel weird and confusing you while you're trying to get lift off. Yeah. Um, right. All right. So next to it is the external microphone for the airplane. And generally, you just you can use the the microphone that's connected to your headset. Um, but they have an external microphone in the name of backup. And uh, below that is the fuel shutoff switch. So I know we just went over the mixture control, and you can use the mixture control as a fuel switch off, su shutoff switch as well by pulling it out all the way. But uh, in the name of redundancy, uh, they also have a fuel shutoff switch. So it's like a master valve at the back. You can pull it, and then it cuts off fuel to the engine. Uh, in case there's some weird stuff happening. And then right below that, you can see the fuel selector. So the fuel selector, basically what it does is, as Nikhil mentioned earlier, the fuel is stored in the tanks. Uh, the fuel tanks are stored in the wings of the airplanes. I'm sorry. The left um, and right and, ones. You know, there's two wings on the airplane. And so there's a fuel tank in the left wing and then a fuel tank in the right wing. Uh, so basically, the fuel selector switch, uh, there's three options. There's the left, there's the right, and then there's the both. Uh, and it determines what tanks the engine is getting fuel from. So the, the reason that it's kind of built in and it's not always set to both tanks equally is because uh, when you say, for example, if you're parked or even if you're flying and there's a leak in the system, uh, you can kind of uh, set your switch to one side uh, so that it only the leak only affects um, one side of the airplane uh and it, it's especially important on the ground uh, like when you're parked when you park the airplane when you turn it off the last thing you do before you leave sort of is you you flip the the fuel selector switch to either the left or the right side so that if there if there happens to be a leak in the system on the ground uh not all of the fuel will leak out of it uh so you know there it won't cause as much damage the leak fuel um but people need to be careful with the fuel selector switch because oftentimes pilots will be flying. They'll they'll be halfway into their cross country and then the engine will just cut out without them expecting it. It has the fuel they just show weird going on and then they panic and then they land in a field in an emergency and then the FAA comes in to inspect stuff and finds out that they forgot to set the fuel selector switch to both. So uh, yeah, people need to be careful around that. And that's kind of why you have a fuel selector switch. All right. And with that, that concludes all the essential instruments that we have to sort of keep our aircraft in a good condition and treat it well, treat it nicely so that it treats us nicely when we want to go on and fly it. Unlike what I'm doing right now, just buzzing the airport like this. So let's pretend I'm not doing this and now move on to our Q&A section. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to put it in the chat or in the uh, Google form that I've also put here in the chat as well. In case you're not comfortable putting it in the chat, we created a form just for you. It's completely anonymous. There is absolutely uh, no personal information asked, just your question. So if you have a question, we'll be checking this now, as well as our email. You can go ahead and email us flyprojectavid at gmail.com. You probably already know that you've received like a million emails from us by now. So yeah, this is the time we'll devote to any questions. Oh, and something you might maybe wondering is the mixture control. So the big red lever that you're not exactly supposed to touch too much while in the air. As Yvraj was explaining, what does it do, Yvraj? Uh, it controls how much fuel is going into the cylinder uh, and, you know, burning up with the air. Yep. So, as you can see, if I were to just maybe let me increase the simulator sound really quick so you can hear what happens. So right now you're going to hear a lot more of the simulator. 
a lot more of the Cessna 172. It's very powerful propeller. And right now my throttle is sort of all the way in, kind of, not really. Don't worry about the beeping thing, it's just being really mean. Now I'm gonna pull this red lever out. Watch what happens. So I'm gonna pull it out. And, and that means there's no more fuel going to the engine. Well, I didn't pull it all the way out, but if oh, I did that, <laughs> yeah. So, something you'll notice actually. If I pull it out, you'll hear the engine, you'll hear the engine get weaker a little bit. And because there's less fuel injected into the cylinder, there's also not as much fuel for it to suck so it can spin the propeller and that's why our propeller starts spinning much slower. And then I put the mixture back in, it increases again, I pull it out, it decreases again. Now you might so, think, uh, well this is like a uh, throttle, but it's... You a cool why don't way we to use this? see the difference between the two is the throttle controls how much air is going into the engine and the mixture controls how much fuel is going into the engine. And then when you get the ratios just right, that's your peak RPM. Yep. So oh, we have a question in the chat that says, um, is it hard to fly at night? Uh, you know, here, let's so fly at night. Steven can answer that. It's not <laughs> hard to fly. You just need to know how to use your instruments, um, especially the six pack instruments that we've been showing you. Um, basically the six main ones in the front in the front that you see on Nikhil's um, stream. Yep. Your airspeed, attitude, altimeter, turn coordinator, heading, heading indicator, and vertical speed. Um, because at night, as you can see right now, you, you can't really see where the horizon is. Uh, you can right now because there's a city and there's city lights, which is beautiful. That's one thing that, that's one reason why night flights are the best. But if you're flying in the middle of nowhere, in mountain terrain or you're flying over the ocean you're not going to be able to see anything it's going to be pitch black so you're going you to want... have to rely purely on your instruments you want to know what middle of nowhere looks like oh you're going to show there you go here's there middle of go. nowhere right over right over oh wait puget no sound. the light's loaded up <laughs> uh maybe put this... it put it farther into puget sound put it in there the ocean go. just go in the ocean just uh the, the scenery is not loaded there there you go now we're pointing yeah. towards nothing ish you can see like nothing here Yep, so you're going to have to know how to use those instruments. And I mean, before you do night flights, you're going you're gonna to have to be, you're going to be really comfortable flying in the daytime. So you're going to know how to use those instruments. All right. Uh, is that really it for questions? Dangerous. Or really can someone check the form? Let's, yeah, I'm going to check, check the form. form really quick. Uh, nothing there in the form. Okay. Uh, well, that that, is my computer being that wraps it up for this stream. Thank you guys so much for joining us for Lesson 4 of the Up and Away series, brought to you by all of us here at the Project AVA team. Uh, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it if you could just butter the touch down on the subscribe and like buttons. It really supports our channel, helps us grow, and brings these lessons to a large community. And with that, it's Friday. It's sunny outside, at least if you live around here in the Bay Area. Have a great weekend. Go step outside. Go have fun. And go be a sky gazer. Go gaze. Don't go sky gaze some airplanes this weekend. Take care, everyone. Have a nice weekend. Have a good one, guys.